Muchísimas gracias, everybody. Hola, Hola buenas. Hello, how are you doing? I'm here, waiting. Luckily, the dogs are sleeping now, so <laughs> So, in case you don't know this about that, would you know a little bit about her or her art? Uh, she's a huge animal lover, and she has um, two new dogs she has adopted in Buenos Aires, in her new house. Hello! <laughs> we are huge fans of uh, animals in this podcast series, <laughs> Animal Loving uh, series. So thank you, Ad, for showing us, and thank you for sharing with us. Uh, I don't know if you want to tell people a little bit about where you are, uh, how are you doing? And, and we can start talking a little bit about your practice with some works, previous works, whichever you want. Yeah, well, thank you everyone for joining us to this informal talk. Sorry, my English. Um, <laughs> you can do some Spanglish. Oh. Yeah. Now, uh, I was thinking to show, to share a little bit of the material that I have from the last project that it's already mm -hmm. online for a while. Um, I think it's something good, in, you know, to do in quarantine. Like I'm watching a lot of YouTube videos and conferences and talks. And I wanted to share basically the, this project I called the Feminist School of Painting. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if uh, everyone is, like uh, already knows about my work. I try to make experiments around painting and mostly uh, geometry and abstraction and modernism, but from a feminist queer perspective. Mm -hmm. Like how can painting also be a tool to rethink art history and the way we process like visual data somehow. Um, so the, the Feminine School of Painting is an experiment that it's actually works as a school. It has classes, it's a big table where you get workshops with collaborators running like the first part of the workshop is a talk, mm -hmm. and the second part is a practical uh, painting workshop where everyone gets to paint, like inspired or from the from the talk that was before. Mm -hmm. And what we have online are all the videos from the talks, mm -hmm. uh, and we have English and Spanish, luckily. <laughs> Because the um, a feminine school of painting first appeared in San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, the Cadiz residency. Uh, Cadiz uh, offered me, you know, apply with a project that so that we were able to engage with local community more than you know other types of contemporary art shows that have like kind of cryptic videos or they wanted to make a project like more open or friendly mm -hmm. somehow. And the idea of the school also came from my own fantasy of studying in the United States when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I don't have that fantasy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. As somebody yeah. who's done it, I can say there's some amazing aspects about that. I mean, with this financial crisis, not a good idea. <laughs> right? I, I think it's, it's a good question at this moment, but at any moment, you know, what type of education we, will, we want for art, but also in general, like how art can be yeah, a tool to understand many other things that visual arts, you know, like a way of thinking too. Mm -hmm. And I find out by, 
talking with a lot of artists and people that study in the United States, that the model or the goal in in our schools there is kind of create a product too. So the education is based on competition, mm -hmm. for example. Um, well, yes. one of the bases of the of this school is like exchange cooperation for competition. Mm -hmm. There's no way, I, I think it's a recipe for failure if you are trained, you know, to compete in the art world. Yes. So just to recap a little bit uh, for those of us who yeah. I see a lot of people joining, um, mm -hmm. Alice talking about uh, the Escuela Feminista de Pintura, the Feminist School of Painting, which is a project that she has created in three institutions already, uh, starting in Cares in San Francisco. It took place at the Museum of Modern Art in Buenos Aires until very recently, and it will take place in a third institution next year. Is that right? Sorry? <laughs> no, 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 no. That the Escuela Feminista de Pintura, the, the School of Feminist Painting is going to happen next year in another, you want to tell them where it's going to happen, that, that explaining people that has like, it's like an itinerant project that you're doing in different museums and you're installing, yeah. like it's a physical space, but it's more importantly, a mental concept, which is what she's explaining about how um, like art education, the education for artists is organized usually around ideas of competition and the importance of creating a feminist school of painting um, that would like uh, try to like bypass that tradition and um, that would like like encourage collaboration. And it was organized about around a physical space that also, you know, and a talk uh, and after the talk, people would create art about what was discussed during that talk, during that discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first one was in San Francisco. The second one was last year in Buenos Aires. And mm -hmm. this year, the third edition will be at the Guangzhou Biennale mm -hmm. in September. Oh, Spectacular. We'll see. Mm -hmm. But okay. mm -hmm. yeah, each edition also, it's very di different and the first one with San Francisco, I also get to be in each class. So mm -hmm. for me, it was amazing. Like it was like a toy store or every Saturday, like I get to, yeah, enjoy amazing collaborators. And sadly mm -hmm. for the one in Buenos Aires, I, I wasn't physically there, mm -hmm. uh, but I get the help from uh, Victoria Musoto, Iki Musoto. Mm -hmm. um, she hosts each workshop. Um, then the third one, because in Korea, the edition will be in Korean. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna be there either. Um, I can show people some images of the editions so far. Ah, uh, yeah, that one was in Buenos Aires. And the third one you were saying, sorry, you were talking about the third one in Korea. It will be, it's a big challenge for me because it's kind of, I'm proposing the school, but I don't have any, mm -hmm. like, the control, <laughs> it's, get, it gets loose, you know, in terms of yeah. language. Well, but yeah. that's very important about your project because it's a collaborative project where you create the concept, you create the space, you paint it, you know, you, I mean, here we see some activities taking place. This one is the mm -hmm. one at Caris. Um And this was the space, this is the space you created empty without people. But then let me go up. Let's see if we have so this I, I say it's an installation that gets to be activated by collaborators exactly. that make these presentations and then everyone paints. So she partners with, with other artists and activists and organizations, whatever she is, um, you know, doing this to have them organize different talks and activities. So yeah. that's quite interesting. Um, 
I'm sorry. So I don't know if you want to keep taking, talking or show other words yourself. I might be interrupting you. Sorry. Uh, and, and what I wanted to share that maybe I can switch also screens mm -hmm. is like the website mm -hmm. where you can find like this one was the the one in San Francisco. So if you go to the F school dot cadiz dot mm -hmm. you get this index and by clicking and you get an overview mm -hmm. where you can get some ideas of the basic library with some materials online that that was the the mm -hmm. humble library on site yes and then some pictures of the classroom and uh, one of the things that it's also the basics of the school is that it is for all ages. Mm -hmm. um, I love, for example, this scene with the the little kid with adults, you know. And I also did like two different tables, mm -hmm. like for kids being like more comfortable in another proportion of table. But then the other kid just wanted to be with adults anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really <laughs> like, good. <laughs> that was so cool. I think that happened to all of us that we were like in family gatherings, put on the kids' table. <laughs> the yeah, yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> I guess I think it also talks about how we treat kids in a way yeah. that the education system is divided by age. Yes, yeah, I absolutely. think that's one of the problems with our education, definitely. Absolutely. Uh, I agree that, yeah, the way we are divided by numbers, it's, yeah. like, it's not good. So, yeah, one of the things of the schools that mm -hmm. I propose is this mix of people, right? Mm -hmm. Different ages. So when we go to workshops, we have like, uh, for example, if I go to mythology, you find the description of the collaborator. Like this one was with Sarah Hotchis. Mm -hmm. She's an artist in San Francisco. And um, then you got notes that take you to a Dropbox folder with the slideshow and more material. And then if you go to video, you go to the, yeah, to YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then you have the class there. And I don't recommend my introductions, but the, all the collaborators' talks are amazing. Mm -hmm. And the way we divide the um, classes into pictorial genres, mm -hmm. it was just an excuse, you know, to work with different points of view. Um, I think it's very funny to, you know, how we can use these genres to break them, basically. Can I ask you something? We have two questions from the audience. Uh, somebody's asking no. if we could share the web page again. I don't know if you have it, I can maybe type it in into the comments so people can see it. Yeah. It's, uh, so basically it's... Cal is art school. I mean, you can see the website that was created yeah. before that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can copy paste it into the comments because I'm using the cell phone for this. But and then uh, Suya Manuel Reda is asking, I mean, the choice about the choice of colors. I mean, and I guess this is an important and larger question, uh, which uh, maybe we can take the opportunity to make, which is about the use of uh, color in your work. Yes, I'm not sure in your works. I can, I mean, while you talk about it, I can simply, I mean, I don't know if you want to give any specific example, but I could also share. Like do a quick scroll through um, your PDF to the audiences and they'll see what 
we're talking about yeah. when we talk about your choice of colors, right? I mean, this is like a typical Minoliti palette, you know, <laughs> palette. I and mean, it's very clearly, uh, you know, a special palette and a very powerful one. And so, yeah, Manuel asked about your choice of colors. Right. Well, I use any color, but for, for example, for the show at the museum in Buenos Aires, I wanted to work with four colors that also refer to like mm -hmm. struggles. Struggles, <laughs> the, okay. The green triangle, it's very obvious here. Which is here. Yeah, the, the national campaign for legal abortion and mm -hmm. reproductive rights. So in Argentina, just, just to explain to the audiences in Argentina and more broadly in Latin America, and I think it started in Argentina, but the point is that happily it became a continental campaign to promote uh, abortion rights and it was through a triangular green handkerchief, like the one that you see here. And Art has been using that in her art installations for a while. She also covered the facade of the Sala Siqueiros in Mexico de Este with this, uh, creating also also a participative and collaborative space inside. But sorry, keep talking about the four colors. You were talking about the four colors that you use for this exhibition. And then we use orange that in the same mm -hmm. symbolism, it takes from the orange triangles that represent the separation between church and government. Mm -hmm. uh, then the violet was because of feminism, and also I I think the purple violet, you know, as this monster color. Mm -hmm. And then the the brown, in, looking for an an anti-racist uh, color, you know, like a brown pride. Mm -hmm. But then also the palette look very like Halloween and sort of makes sense also with the idea of the ambient of the show that was opening on Halloween and then mm -hmm. it has a lot of weird monsters. <laughs> Yeah, what about this? I mean, wow. you've been doing this for a while, like this idea of the Musa Peluche, and it's like these figures that appear uh, either represented in your paintings or as an installation in your exhibitions. I mean, here we have one which is quite amazing, but I mean, mm. I've seen them through the years. Hmm. So it's it has all these layers that it's, it refers to things that I believe are very important, but it's also cartoonish and mm -hmm. and also the palette if you see like in the I'm gonna change again. Okay. So in the and the, the Argentinian school uh, also mm -hmm. the palette work in a way as some I don't know, some psychedelic you know, climate or mm -hmm. so it looks very decorative but um, yeah I think it makes sense for, with all these layers you know mm -hmm. playing as political colors but also as something funny tender child, childish too Mm -hmm. mm. Um, um, I have yeah. another question here, maybe from Monica. Yes. Monica, let okay. me read it to you. I mean, I mean, she has some. Um, I think it's an interesting question. In your case, uh, can you imagine how exhibitions could happen now? Taking your own work as an example, how your work could travel without doing it and still be meaningful. 
And the interesting thing, before you say anything, uh, is that Ari has been preparing for this for ages <laughs> because we talked about this many, 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 many times and you have like adjusted the concept of your projects for this a lot. Um, anyway. Well, actually, for example, now there is a show that mm -hmm. it's online. Like I think internet also breaks a lot of Hello, I think, let's give it one second. I think Ad is having some technical issues. Hola, you're back. You okay. can go now uh, and the internet, sorry. No, I think like this, of course the internet will be like always important and mm -hmm. with all the museums and gallery closed, I think, yeah, everything we can do with this tool is gonna get bigger. And I think, I mean, artists adapt. Yeah. <laughs> they have to, right? <laughs> like, of course, we're going to be creative, everyone. Like, not, not only artists. And I think because I always wanted to work an idea of painting that goes beyond the technique, that yeah. I have a lot of works that are digital. Mm -hmm. So even though I don't have any major or anything on animation or like, yeah, mm -hmm. like graphic design, like for me, Photoshop, it's like the main core of my pr practice. So, and, and that's very interesting. And that can link to another question, which is God, because you've been doing this, um, digital version of painting if you like for a long time but at the same time your your painting is very much a painting you're very much a pintora you know and um, there is a huge tradition of painting in argentine art uh of female painters in argentine art which i think is very important and that you're a part of um and at the same time you've been like forcing this turn to digital for a long time um and without painting, losing the material quality of that. And one reason why I think you do that has to do with the question that Mariana Castillo de Val is asking, which is what is the relation between painting and architecture, you know? And the fact that you are painting architecture, you know, you create your own architectures. I mean, a lot of the spaces that we, we've been seeing is has to do with like, let me show this to mm. the people. Um, we actually have a background. This is my background. This is not a minority work. It could be, but it's not. That is simply my cat in my background. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, just to show people, I'm sorry, you can start talking about it if you want, but this relationship between painting architecture and the painting of architecture, which I think is a great question that Mariana Castillo de Val asked. Mm. Well, I think my take on architecture is like also from frustration because when I was a kid, I wanted to be an architect. <laughs> but then, because I thought it was like, okay, I'm gonna get money, but at the same time, I'm gonna be able to create like another fantasy that is not. But then, the thing with when you start looking at modernism and how all these ideas of this men, you know, get to design like the way we live or even our own fetish on um, mm -hmm. design in terms of the chairs, you know, furniture, not only buildings, but also the urban design. It's like, it becomes like very clear that it's also part of the discourse that I want to tackle on painting, you know, all these mm -hmm. ideas from modernism that kind of, yeah, ruin us every day. Like, for example, the way the white cube is like set up in mm -hmm. all the, yeah, the paradig paradigms 
the our yeah, the paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how how to transform spaces? I think it's it's a good question for painting. Um, Absolutely. I think that's the mainly relationship, but mm -hmm. mostly we yeah, have how modernism set the basis on the way we live in the Western Absolutely. society. Mm. And it's amazing that you, instead of like choosing another route, you take on all these legacies of like modernism, the, you know, the geometric shapes and the, the structure, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if people can see it in the scoring I'm doing, but like, for example, this building, you know, it's a typical modernist building, you know, the cicadas, Sara Siqueiros, and she converts it. I mean, it's still very modernist element, but at the same time, it's really soft and it's inhabited, you know, inhabit, sorry, um, playing with this political symbol of the green triangle, you know, and this was like, what was it, two, three years ago, way be before the feminist wave in Mexico. Um, uh, so it was like a risky move That was also. 2017, I think. <laughs> yeah, like three years ago, oh my God. Yeah. Mm. But for example, that was mm -hmm. an awesome project and it was related also with the feminist school of painting because mm -hmm. the idea was to transform the Sala Siqueiros into a sort of cultural center. Yeah. But also playing with the, the political, you know, Mexican mm -hmm. muralism that mm -hmm. it's, and also with the pink triangle that Carlos Mota did before. Mm -hmm. And kind of keep the conversation between the things that happened there, but also how to take over with other type of activities, like mm -hmm. the gift shop, we transform it into a gift shop that was actually selling uh, products and work from uh, female artists, designers in, mm -hmm. from Mexico and from other places. We have the table, the triangle tables, uh, where we have all this reading material that was from my personal collection of fan scenes scenes mm -hmm. and in the publications, but also from a local collection. And mm -hmm. it was very interesting to have, for example, a fanzine, you know, about um, how you say self-exam, like how to uh, do your own gynecological exam or something. How do you mm -hmm. say? But then, yeah, like your own, like yeah, like to check yourself for any kind of like, yeah, medical issue. Yeah. Yeah. How how to hack, you know, sex education somehow. Exactly. Then a, a fun scene that was replicate on photocopies, like mm -hmm. very do it yourself, and because that fun scene was at the Sala Siqueiros like that paper reach, you know, people that wouldn't look for that information online, for example, mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very interesting to get from the people that was coordinating, like the guided visits and the education department, that they told me like a lot of people was happy to find something so weird you know, or like, because mm -hmm. they have a special programs with, you know, with single moms or with adults that are living in homes and geriatric. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was interesting to change the space with so little, yeah. just a color, but basically 
a lot of different content and materials. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's a way also of changing the architecture and the function of the space, you know, mm -hmm. just with the excuse of the pictorial installation. Yes. And something you do with the shapes is that you open and close the space, to the, the spaces to communicate them, kind of like divide the idea of the interior, exterior. I don't know if people can see that here, this is a window, a triangular window, oh, yeah. um, you know, and how this platform is like breaking the idea of the painting being elevated in the floor, in, in, in the wall, which is a typical display. But here your representations are like somehow like laying down. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that one was in, in Basel mm -hmm. statement mm -hmm. last year. Yeah. And my proposal was to make like a giant computer, it kind of mm -hmm. look like a toy too. So the keyboard was the paintings mm -hmm. and the whole set for me was a sort of homenaje to, yeah, cyber feminism. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, all these things that you can find on the internet. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. can, yeah, open path. Mm -hmm. um, if you um, want, I, yeah. I can show. That would be great. Please show us. Uh -huh. Please show us. Yes, that would be great. Then, because that one was the, I show the, English mm -hmm. website that uh, we also have a blog, Tumblr, that is escuelafeminista.tumblr.com. And there you get to see the pictures in Buenos Aires. But mm -hmm. then you go down, down. I have the videos in Spanish. Mm -hmm. this, uh, were also amazing, like, let me see where I have them. Basically here, it's a reproduction list at the mm -hmm. museum's account. So you get to see like classes with Mm -hmm. Yeah, with activists, academics, and artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. And all this one is in Spanish. So, that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That. Well, actually, there's a question that has to do with that. Uh, Madeline is asking, Matt Murphy Turner is asking, um, I mean, about your experience working, we talked about this a little bit already, but your experience talking, uh, you know, working with uh, feminist practice in different countries, you know, or how do you have to rethink the idea of feminism when you go to a different location? Um, Something important that I do want to say, I mean, you're probably going to say it, but just to highlight it, is that Ad does a, a, a research trip each time. She doesn't just land, you know, she's not landing in Korea. You know, she she went there like one or two, two times already to do research on groups, which I think is very I, important. I went one time, but I, for the begin, from the beginning, I, I talked with the curators and the production and everyone that, the idea is of the my work is a proposal, so in mm -hmm. no way like I'm given a definition, you know, yeah. or trying to impose my ideas on mm -hmm. other countries. But I want to make the space so local collaborators can take over, you know, and mm -hmm. create their own like workshops and according to what they believe it's also necessary. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm, for me, it's a challenge, the, the one in Korea, because 
I don't get to understand, you know, um, when I see when I see the videos of or the classes of the other two editions, you know, mm -hmm. it's their language I understand. But then in, in Korean, even though we are working together with each collaborator and mm -hmm. we have amazing talks, you know, on how create the, every workshop, like at the end, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna know what's going to happen, you know? Absolutely, and something that I want to highlight, I mean, I wanna say this myself about you, is that something that I always respected about your practice is that you never position yourself, not even in your own culture, not even in Argentina, you never position yourself as the specialist in feminism or the specialist in painting or the specialist in feminist paint. You always do, I mean, and that's why you bring other people and other voices to dialogue and you bring, you know, I mean, your practice is super intersectional. As cliche as it might sound to say something like that, I mean, in your case, in the case of Padre Minoliti, it's absolutely intersectional, you know, that like she's always like in dialogue with people that do activism for certain specific groups and specific identities and specific economic classes and she brings them into the art table into the museum and also takes the museum outside of the museum to deal with these people as much as it can be done, you know? Um, and I think that, that that's a very honest and clear aspect of your practice. I wanted to ask you, and in relation to the previous question about color, I mean, I, I remember a few years ago, um, really in a debate, I think it was around the, like, um, like a, a public conversation that was published about, I think it was with Yuki and Mueller, I don't remember, this was while I was in grad school, about like the idea of genre in, paint, in painting, like a genre and gender, which is something that I think you explore a lot if you're in your practice, how, you know, painting has a history of genre, you know, like different types of like um, genitals of painting, historical painting, you know, and um, at the same time, the question of whether they can be a gender, genero, uh, identitario, mm -hmm. or like, you know, to painting, or if painting can discuss issues of gender. Um, and I don't know well, how you feel about that. When I start thinking about gender in mm -hmm. my work, like at the beginning in the art school, because I, I didn't have internet at the time, so a lot of material I, I couldn't find. Yeah. But then all these feelings around, you know, discrimination or how you, as an assigned female at birth artist, you get excluded, you know, mm -hmm. in like art school and art history make you feel like a loser mm -hmm. <laughs> somehow. But then all those feelings like make sense when I start reading about yeah feminist theory or for example if you read Judith Butler in Spanish and then you play you know with yeah, reading gender as genre mm -hmm. a very interesting game you know to rethink painting like absolutely for example, like how the performance of each genre, you know, basically build the way you think about some subjects. Like, exactly. And just to make it super explicit for anybody listening who doesn't speak Spanish, in Spanish we have the same word for it. It's mm -hmm. género. So in Spanish it becomes even more explicit the relationship in between genre and genre. Anyway, yeah. just that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's any other work you would like to show while people might have any other question. Uh, well, going back to how we can explode, you know, mm -hmm. internet in a way to mm -hmm. create other types of shows. Like one of the things I, I shared that the link is on my video mm -hmm. is uh, let me switch. This is my series of coloring books. Mm -hmm. So if you go to my, uh, 
profile, you get to download this. And mm -hmm. that basically, I love this series in terms of thinking also a performative painting mm -hmm. because the coloring books, like I was always told that they were oppressive, that there is no creative act, you know, in coloring something that is already drawn. Mm -hmm. But then I had to rethink the device of coloring as a proposal again, and you get to start a, a, a game, you know, that mm -hmm. I'm also proposing, you know, different ways of living, uh, how my non-binary geometry figures, you know, live with chickens or other animals. And mm -hmm. These games of interiors and landscape too. There, I think it's, yeah, mm -hmm. I love the potential of another type of interactions outside the white cube. Um, Mm -hmm. so. And I mean, uh, yeah, and outside the YQ and outside the MC, but it's also, I mean, I think it's important. I don't know if you noticed that, but there's been like this like crazy rebirth of coloring, um, of coloring charts because of kids being trapped due to the COVID crisis. And everybody yeah. is like retaking on the idea of the coloring um, and the coloring exercise, even though it's very entertaining. I mean, it's also very complicated. It has to do with this, like the traditional coloring exercise has to do also with this uh, kind of like, uh, it traditionally had to do with this oppressive, um, oppressive economy of coloring and of uh, art practice. I mean, growing up, you were supposed to paint things and they would tell you which color to paint each thing. You know, they would put your number and you had to paint it in a certain way. And you are like uh, taking that tradition and inverting it again, because not even like the representations that you are asking people to paint or proposing people to paint, they don't make sense. You know, they're not like the traditional flower and the animal in the form, you know, they're not normative. I'm talking again about gender and genre, you know, you are taking the genre of uh, the coloring book and subverting it to insert alternative ideas of images, alternative ideas of animality. I don't know if you say animality, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, mm -hmm. you know how they have this huge trend of mandalas or a thing to yes. coloring that... Mm -hmm are kind of like mechanical yes. okay just so you distract yourself but not thinking mm -hmm. um, but no I think when you're doing something with your hands it's like the best moment also to think again but maybe with mm -hmm. your hands you know and also yeah so why not to hack that content too, or make different mm -hmm. stories. Like the coloring books are also used like toys, dollhouses, you know, into like bajar línea, how you say, like. Mm -hmm. a, to, yeah, to set an agenda, set an agenda, you would say. Yeah, yeah. like how we're supposed to live or Mm -hmm. You know, how you're supposed to treat other people or mm -hmm. animals or mm -hmm. the, like the storytelling, yeah. you know, are very, are disciplinary devices. Absolutely. That's why I, I love like childhood and all the devices of childhood and, and the aesthetics on how to subvert the narrative that we are told, like yeah. how to live or not. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, and it's also a way to to teach kids alternative uses of this a system of images, right? I mean, yeah. like just the idea of teaching somebody younger than 10 years old that they can draw something that doesn't mm. have the shape of something they see. I mean, it's such a, 
um, I remember uh, in relation to what you're saying, studying art history. You know, when I started studying art history, I honestly, I didn't came from, you know, a, a sophisticated, educated family. I came from a middle class family that didn't knew much about art. And I went to study art history thinking that abstraction was kind of a pretentious project, you know. I mean, of course I did. And then I remember going to school and it really took like six years of schooling for me to understand actually the, the liberatory revolutionary project of abstraction, at least in its pets. You know, at the beginning, in, in its more utopian alternatives, you know, how it was trying to break this idea of representation and how the oppression was actually the assumption behind representation. But something as basic as that, I mean, we take for granted. And, and once you get into the art world, you assume that everybody's going to understand that abstraction is revolutionary. And I think that by, by mixing, like, the traditions of, like, abstraction with the traditions of everyday life, like you're doing in the coloring books, mm -hmm. you are bringing back this problem and reminding, you know, the people in the art world that this is a fight that we must keep battling because it has to do with the economy of images that we use in our everyday life well beyond the museum. It doesn't matter whether in the museum we are showing abstraction. But also uh, abstraction, yeah. for example, in Lat Latin America also proposed a type of revolution that mm -hmm. for me... Uh, for many people, has a lot of issues too, like mm -hmm. what kind of revolution, like uh -huh. also you are proposing, you know, because it's the same with feminism. Like you have inside the movement a lot of people that is like transphobic, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's like I don't want to be part of your movement, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. trans excluding a radical mm -hmm. feminism, or like now. There is such a high, like a rise of feminists against like sex workers and mm, here in Argentina. Yes. And it's Terrible. like, because as part of the like mainstream feminism that it's associated also with the government mm -hmm. at the time, it's like horrible. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to be feminist <laughs> if that's the. <laughs> the thing, you know, but yeah. so I think it's also we think about these big words and it's also an umbrella and I, I think it, it's good to have a clear distinction. You know? mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, but at yeah. the same time, once we start having that distinction, remem reminding ourselves that we need to we have an educational role, like teaching people that abstraction, you know, like, I mean, mm -hmm. there's some of us who have understood that abstraction could be liberatory, but then that abstraction could also be bad, you know, uh, but we have to fight the battle with the person. I mean, let's use the example of feminism, both of the person that, you know, is not being intersectional and is being a bad feminist with also on the other side, the battle against, I mean, a lot of people out there that are still not in thinking about feminism. Mm. So, I mean, it's really tricky. It's really tricky. And I think that your work is very interesting with regards to all these battles because it's never settling for a definition. You know, it's always like looking for something out. And that's, I mean, that's, that's rich. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mm. another difference with the, the education system in the United States, I think, when... Mm -hmm when you have like an experimental or a, an alternative education, like the one you have in Argentina too, mm -hmm. like you don't set up for a formula, you know, mm -hmm. like your work is always like changing, like also, mm -hmm. because you don't want to reach like a, a style or a formula. I mean, I don't want to, get to a product, like I want to get through an experience to mm -hmm. learn from that, even though I'm 80 years old or mm -hmm. 10, so. And I think that's absolutely possible. Okay, um, you wanna tell people we only have a few more minutes and I wanna make sure that we don't get cut by Instagram, which after an hour is gonna cut us down whether we like it or not. 
<laughs> because the internet is regulated also. <laughs> Um, but um, I wanted, I don't know if you want to share with people um, any projects that you've been working on or something that you're planning to do. Well, I have this sketch of the, this is a secret. Now, for example, Ooh. sketch for the, the Vienna, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Approved, we'll see what happened. Mm -hmm. That's um, beautiful. Yeah. I don't know. I think everything we show is basically online also to access and yes. I hope they enjoy it. That is fantastic. Um, I don't know if we have any other question, but otherwise I'm going to ask you all to join me in thanking Ad for sharing this time with us and um, her beautiful works. Uh, do you want to repeat people, show them uh, the websites where they can see more about your work before you leave? Uh, Just to... mm -hmm. So we have the, the one in English is the F school and then the Tumblr, you know, with the Spanish edition, mm -hmm. is Escuela Feminista. That's Tumblr. That, yeah, on So on both websites, you get the links to the videos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There. That's amazing. So that's it, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody, and thank you. A lot of people are sending love in the in the notes. Love for you too, and thank you for joining us. And gracias, Sal. Bye. <laughs>